All right, guys, so this is going to be the last kind of review um, PowerPoint presentation that we have, and it's on the Angular Kinetic, Kinetics one. Um, I'm going to only go into the brief, basic components of Angular Kinetics, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the special components of it, work, uh, power, um, impulse, momentum, relationship, and class, um, and relate a little bit more to um, the actual movement. So, um, so the outline for this, we're just going to quickly talk about what the definition of angular force is. Um, we're going to do the Newton's analogs, and then we'll talk about some of the lever classes because those are important concepts here. Um, so what is angular kinetics? Well, it's a branch of mechanics that deals with the causes, right? So the left-hand portion of that, of angular motion. Um, it is similar to the linear counterpart, um, dealing with the causes. And then torque, um, it's the angular component of force, and then it is... The, Newton meters is uh, the units, and you'll see where the meters comes into play with torque, um, but it's that angular component here. So again, here's the equation, torque equals force times the radius, the perpendicular radius. Um, and again, you'll understand a little bit more in a second here, um, but it's relative to the distance the force is applied to uh, the pivot axis. Um, again, the units, Newton meters. Um, so torque is the moment of force. So that's another term to utilize um, when you're talking about uh, the angular component of force. I um, mean, that's given that uh, moment arm of the R perpendicular. So let's talk about how the application of force occurs um, when you deal with moving something. And, and we use a wheelchair because a wheelchair has two possibilities of, of rotation, but it also has a, a possibility of movement. Um, so the direction of motion in A is, is I'm, e I'm applying equal force between the left and right hand. Um, and so I have a linear um, displacement or a linear, linear motion of the wheelchair. If I applied only a force with the right hand or the right hand applied a greater force um, than the left hand, you would have a counterclockwise rotation a moment or a movement about some axis um, and you'd have a translation of the right. Now, how do we determine what the torque is? Well, so there's three possibilities with the way to apply a force. Um, if I did A, where I applied a force at the axis of rotation, you would generally have um, no motion or no, or no movement because um, there is zero perpendicular arm uh, or moment arm to cause rotation about that axis. B is a situation where you have a force application that is in a right angle um, to the pivot accent, axis. So um, the line of action of uh, the force application is the right hand. So the shortest distance is that moment arm. But then you also have a case in C where I'm applying a force at some angle um, to the arm, right? So um, if I have a pull and I apply a, a force in a 50 degree angle, then the moment arm is actually going to be the, if I extend, and that's where you see that black dotted line. So I have to extend out the vector of where I apply the line, and this is where the line of action is, is the blue vector, but I extend that line of action back out to create a shortest distance right angle um, to the pivot or axis of rotation. And that's what we call the moment arm. So the moment arm is the shortest um, distance of a right angle to the line of action of the force. Um, and so that's how you would do it, and how you calculate it. So what I wanna do is talk to you about a little bit how convert Newton's three laws of motion into the angular analogs. And it's very easy. Um, all you do is you put the angular component of these. So you have the law of inertia. Um, and so its rotating body will continue in the state of uniform mo angular motion unless it's acted on by an ex external. So this is that inertia concept, right? So it's the resistance of motion. Um, and here you have the sum of torques on the left-hand side. So all we're doing is sub sub substituting force, which is the linear component, to torque, which is the angular component. Um, so the sum of torques equals zero, therefore the change in angular velocity, which is at omega, is zero. Um, and what is the moment inertia? What's the quantity of resistance to the change in angular motion? Um, now the difference between um, the linear and angular component of this is, is that this takes in the distribution of masses. Um, so not only the mass, but also the distribution of mass um, where in the linear components, it's generally just a mass concept, right? Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in class and how it relates, but that the distribution of masses is, is very um, important with relationship to the axis of rotation. Think about a baseball bat, think about how your body's 
um, oriented, those type of things. But here you have um, the moment of inertia, which is I. Um, and in this equation, so it's the sum of the masses um, and the radius squared. So where the mass is located on the segments relative to the radius which through which it is located to the axis of rotation squared. Um, and, and this is a sum of because you take all the individual particles and you summate them to create the, the moment of inertia. Okay. And then you have the radius of gyration, and this is where it comes into play. Um, I equals M rho is that radius um, of gyration. Um, and this is going to be coming into big play um, when you talk about different components of the body. So you're not going to need to know um, the equation for radius of gyration. I'm not going to have you explain it. But just know that radius of gyration is, is the mass distribution about the axis of rotation. Um, and this comes into play um, with causing, uh, making things easier um, to rotate or more difficult to rotate. And then how much effort you have to put in to cause that rotation. So these two uh, images are, are meant to depict what happens and how you would adjust um, the law of inertia or, or the moment of inertia um, throughout motion. Um, on the left-hand side, we're going to look at B. Um, when you do a, a, a forward tuck or, or some kind of somersault um, to decrease the moment of inertia and therefore uh, be able to increase uh, the, the angular velocity, you're going to tuck yourself, so you're going to decrease that the inertial components um, and the overall inertia of the system. Um, and then if you look on the right-hand side, you have somebody running. And we're going to take uh, the stance leg um, for the first part of this. Um, and it, as the uh, leg is extended and prepared for stance, the moment of inertia is increased. And as you go through swing phase, um, because the leg is becoming bent and, and coming closer to the axis of rotation, um, you're actually going to decrease the law of in the moment of inertia um, and therefore increase the ability to um, generate angular velocity um, at a greater rate. Um, so now let's move on to the second uh, uh, law of Newton, and that's going to be the law of angular acceleration. Um, and this is where uh, external torques will be produced um, at an ex angular acceleration of the system proportional to and in the direction of the torque. But it's also inversely proportional to the moment of inertia. So here you have torque equals I, which is the moment of inertia, um, times alpha, um, which is angular acceleration, right? So torque is the angular component of our angular analog of force. I is the angular analog of mass. And alpha is the angular analog of acceleration. Um, so angular, angular momentum um, is the quantity of angular motion of an object. So it's the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. Um, so torque is the rate change of angular momentum. Um, so here you have, I'm going to break it down to you and just derive it for you. So torque equals I alpha, um, which torque, if you take the I alpha and you, and you derive it, it's delta omega over delta T. So the change in velocity over the change of time. To go further, if you just rearrange that and bring delta T over to the left-hand side, you have torque times delta T. Um, and here's where you have the angular momentum coming to play, right? So on the right-hand side of this equation, um, you have moment of inertia delta um, uh, angular velocity. So that is the momentum components, right? So mass times velocity is momentum. Um, and so here, the angular component of that is I uh, delta omega. So what that does is it, it you, have, you have torque on the left-hand side. And now we're going to bring back um, the delta T onto the right-hand side. So Torque is change in momentum over change in time. Um, so that is another way for us to look at the torque um, and how it results in the momentum of, of the, the force angular momentum relationship. Um, so here's just another depiction of different parts of the body um, and how it goes to the, the running cycle. Uh, so left heel strike um, and how the head and trunk move, the body moves and the arms move. So this is all upper body torso. And then you have the delta, the, uh, dotted blue line um, representative of what's happening. So this is all angular momentum um, as far as um, the positions go. So you can see, look, look at that a little bit and find out through the gait cycle 100% from left foot strike all the way to left foot strike, uh, how the body's moving. Now a major um, important thing is to talk about center of mass. Um, we'll, we'll also talk about center of gravity, but 
center mass is the is is one of the most important aspects of of angular systems and and with the moment of inertia um, and radius of gyration and it's the location of the system at which the sum of the torques is equal to zero um, so all mass is equally distributed when you talk about the center of mass and so what you'll have is say you have a balancing point um, you have a three kilometers uh, mass on one side two kilometers on the other side you can identify where c needs to be by creating the sum of torques equal to each other um, so if i wanted to if i knew that um, i had an axis i could calculate how far out each of these masses need to be for the torques to be equal um, and this is just a little mathematic thing and and you won't have to calculate any of this for for the class but you have to understand the concept um, that the torques um, given two masses the distance away from a balancing point would be different um, to equate the torque. And so if I want to balance about a center of mass, the torques need to be equal to each other. And that's Newton meters and the distance, the mass and the distance away from the axis. Um, so these are just a couple of depictions, right? So you'll, we've all seen these, these rocks um, that are odd shapes that um, are bouncing each other. Um, and that's simply because you put them in an orientation where the center of mass um, lines up. Um, this one, you, you see that the torques are a little bit, um, this shows you a little bit more like the angular concept of it, where um, you have those flat rocks that are being able to be balanced because you're equating the sum of torques um, being equal to each other. Um, if one torque was greater than the other one, then you wouldn't be able to have this balancing effect um, of stroking. So this is just showing you a little bit about the rocks and how they're balanced on top of each other. Um, the final part of this lecture, we're just talking about the levers um, because levers are a way for um, us to use uh, the angular components in angular motion, um, especially kinetics and how we apply our forces a, a, a relative to a fulcrum in order to move the resistive force. Um, mechanical advantage is going to be representative of the mechanical effectiveness. So what happens is uh, mechanical advantage um, equals the effort arm divided by the resistance arm. Um, and, and what I mean by arm is the location or the distance away from the axis of rotation, right? Um, so if we have the elbow, you see that triangle where is the axis of rotation. The effort force is the muscle um, and the distance uh, between where that um, greatest perpendicular distance, right? So the shortest perpendicular distance from where the force is acting in the line of application to that axis is the effort arm. Um, and the resistive arm is, is going to be at the center of mass of the forearm in that position. Um, gravity pulling straight down, so it's fast center gravity, um, and, and it's that shortest perpendicular distance of that resistive force. So the arms are the, the, the meters part, or, or the distance part, um, where the force is acting in the shortest perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation. So there's three possibilities with uh, the, me the mechanical uh, advantage, and if MA equals 1, it's meant to alter the direction of motion and balance the lever. Um, this doesn't magnify either the effort or resistance, so they're equal on both sides. Think about um, the teeter-totter, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but then you have the mechanical advantage where it magnifies the torque created by the effort arm, right? So if this equation is greater than 1, then the effort arm has to be greater than the resistance arm. Um, therefore, you're magnifying the effort force. And a mechanical advantage of uh, less than 1 means that the resistance arm is being uh, greater than the effort arm. So you're increasing uh, the force required to overcome that resistance. Um, this is um, mostly for velocity or speed of movement magnified to the greater distance of the resistance force moved through. Um, so now let's talk about the different classes of levers. Um, so we'll go eat through each class, give you some examples, and then um, we'll talk a lot about this in class as well. So first class lever, the effort force applied to the resistive force are on the opposite sides of the fulcrum. So in this case, you have a fulcrum in the middle. You have the effort and the resistive force. Now, they don't have to be equal distance, right? This could be because if one's greater than the other one, and that's the reason why um, you have a mechanical advantage of one less than one and, and greater than one. So this one, um, it doesn't favor one mechanical advantage of the other. It can be all three. just depends on the distance of each of these um, arms relative to the fulcrum. And some examples of this are seesaw, balance scale, crowbar, um, those type of things. Um, in the system, in the human body, um, one of the... The major one is, is going to be here where, where your spine um, attaches to your head. Um, so the effort force is on the back, and those are the spinal muscles, spinal recti muscles, who are in charge of keeping your head up. 
um, where the resistive force is center of gravity of the head being pulled straight down. And the fulcrum is where that attaches in the back. So there it says the occipital facet. So you have um, the resistive force and the effort force on the opposite sides of the fulcrum. The next is a second class lever. Um, this is where the effort force um, and the resistive force act on the same side of that fulcrum. Um, the classic example of this is the wheelbarrow, um, where the resistive force and the effort, fo or effort force are on the same side. Therefore, the resistance arm and the effort arm are on the same side of the fulcrum. Um, and this has a mechanical advantage of greater than what? Because the effort arm is greater than the resistive arm. Therefore, the mechanical advantage is greater than one. Um, the, the idea with this in the, in the body is, is the toe raises. So um, because of the direction of the resistive force, um, arm and um, the uh, uh, effort force arm um, greater than one and the toe raises um, and the fulcrum there is going to be where the toes are in contact with the ground right so right at the ball of your feet a third cast lever is um, more where the effort force and resistive force on the same side of the fulcrum again um, but they're in a different orientation right so this time the effort arm is between the resistive arm and the fulcrum where second you have it the opposite way you have fulcrum um, resistive effort. This one you have um, fulcrum effort resistance. And a classic example is, is a shovel. Um, the left arm is the fulcrum. The right arm is the effort force and the resistive force is all the way out at the top of the um, shovel there where you, whatever you're trying to dig up. Um, this actually is the, is the one that is the majority of the human structure um, because of the attachments of the muscle um, and the relationship of uh, the center mass of most of the segments. Uh, most of um, the the muscles go across an, uh, a joint or an articulation, causing a motion about it. Um, so where the movement is and where the actual effort uh, of the muscle is, is causing the movement is in between uh, the fulcrum and the resistive force. Um, this favors speed and range of motion with the mechanical advantage of less than one. Um, and that's really what our bodies are designed so for is to uh, maximize the ability to alter speed um, but also to, to take advantage of, of the majority of range of motion throughout the body of, of specified range of motion. Um, this is just a little depiction for you, a little, little um, table that, I've, that I found on the internet that um, really does a good job of showing the relationship. And so you have first class lever, second class lever, third class lever, um, what the general concept is with the relationship to the world, and then, then the major concept of it related to the body. Again, the same three that we used. Um, so to help some people out, I was looking at FAR is class 1, ARF is class 2, and then AFR is class 3, um, fulcrum, uh, applied force, resistive force, and that's what ARF and FAR and those things stand for.